good afternoon uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you all for this distinguished lecture series number 17 uh, we have uh, the privilege of mr chirag bhaijal managing director commercial hvac carrier india to be here with us to deliver uh, this distinguished lecture uh, chirag mr chirag bhaijal chirag as we call him is the managing director of uh, commercial hvac india region and chairman of the board of carrier in india he is responsible for managing and growing the business with brands like uh, Carrier and Toshiba for both the India region and uh, other SAR countries. Over 20 years of experience in diverse fields such as refrigeration, tools, automotive equipment, financial services, and building industries. He has been with Carrier for the last 14 years and has worked in leadership period over a, uh, over a considerable period of time. And coming to his contribution and leadership uh, uh, with the sector, He's a thought leader in the field of sustainability. I have had the privilege of interacting with him for more than a decade. Uh, uh, and he has been the exit board member in uh, the CII Indian Green Building Council. He has been involved with the green building movement right from the very inception. He's a member of the Executive Council of AEEE Alliance for an Energy Efficient Economy and the Executive Council of CII for the Haryana region. He is a national executive board member of AmCham India and also coaches the Energy Council for Promoting Sustainability in India. Mr. Baijal is involved in public policy advocacy for regulation and standards in the field of energy efficiency with Bureau of Energy Efficiency and on standards with the Bureau of Indian Standards and the Ministry of Environment and Forest. Over and above that, uh, uh, Chirag is known for his uh, precise thoughts and the brilliance with which he articulates those thoughts. Over to you, Chirag, for, uh, for, your, uh, for your thoughts and presentation. Thank you so much, Giri. That's very generous and kind of you. Uh, yes, outside of the day job at Carrier, I do take personal pleasure and it's uh, over a period of time, the passion with which we must undertake the activity around talking of sustainability. It's actually commendable the way uh, I have noticed how the CII GBC Center has been uh, creating platforms like these to talk about uh, impact on the climate, looking at green building as a framework, why green buildings make a difference. Uh, also having frankly as India Green Building Council more than 90% of the green built uh, certification under its belt. But the credit actually for the awareness goes to so many of you who are doing this selflessly and tirelessly for years together. And I, like you said, we've been engaged in this for more than a decade. I have myself seen this up close and personal with the IGBC team. So the credit actually goes to all of you. So I do thank each one of you that you've given this opportunity that I come and speak today on the topic of energy efficiency. What I'm going to do is uh, share just about seven, eight slides, but the narrative is more about provoking a thought and then making it interactive so that I can take questions. Because on the digital platform, while the advantage is that it can reach out to more number of people across the country, the disadvantage is that it's also a unilateral one sided messaging. I would rather have also more questions, but at the end of this hour, if uh, there is a takeaway for all of us of what is it that we would like to go back and think, reflect, and hopefully take an action on. We would have done some good work around spending or investing this one hour between all of us. So with that, uh, I'll get into the presentation, give myself about uh, 20, 25 minutes, and then keep ourselves uh, some more time to have a dialogue, either on the information, the facts, or the areas that I'm going to talk to you about or outside of that as well. And I'll attempt to answer as many of them as I can. Yeah. So let's start with uh, understanding and looking at the basics of what's happening around us. Because many a times, even acknowledging of uh, acknowledgement of what is going on around us gives us a good lens to start asking a question: Why energy efficiency is important? And this subject uh, 
to be fair and uh, clear is very broad. It is uh, possible that we can address some part of it in today's discussion and the balance of it. If there are more questions and thoughts, we can try and see if we can come back and talk about some of the other areas. What we've noticed is that uh, developing countries overall will undergo urbanization. India is no exception, but frankly, India is expected to continue to urbanize faster than the rest of the world. Now, let me give you some numbers around this. So overall billion square meters is, let's say about 16 billion square meters, what India has today is expected to go to about 57 billion square meters by 2050. And what it means is that Many of you would have read this, that when Mahatma Gandhi used to talk about the India, the sentence was that India actually resides in the villages. Now, what is happening to India post the reforms started in 1990 onwards is that we are organizing fast. We are going to have a larger built environment. So the compounded annual growth rate of the built environment in India will be 3.7% on the 16 billion square meters versus the world average of about 1.7 percent. So we can easily imagine what it's going to do to our urban cities in the next uh, 25 years by the time India turns 100 years of independence. Some sectors will obviously grow faster than the others. Just to give you a sense that uh, many of us have been reading about uh, India's aspiration to become a 5 trillion economy. So we are a two trillion economy, right? Our manufacturing uh, contributes about only 15 to 16% of the GDP. Now, while we also aspire to be a larger trade partner in the global trade, the reality is that India cannot become a five trillion economy till the time the manufacturing GDP contributions go up to about 25%. So while the services contribution will remain about a good healthy 55% plus, but the Manufacturing is where the government thrust is, and I think it's very clearly visible to each one of us the way we see policies, intervention, and uh, PLI schemes being rolled out. Now, what this will mean also is that we will have a huge demand growth on cooling. So we're going to have the India Cooling Action Plan, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, has been uh, a very important uh, document released uh, in collaboration with the American Council of Energy Efficiency energy efficiency and the Bureau of Energy Efficiency has participated in that, but under the AGs of the Ministry of Environment and Forest in India. So we're looking at an aggregate demand growth of about eight times, whereas the buildings cooling demand will go up by 11 times. We are increasingly now going to see the digitalization impact our lives across everything that we do at work or in our homes which means that we will rely a lot more on data and which essentially means that if the data privacy laws in India become tighter, we are going to see a whole lot more of data centers, for example, exploding in the India scene. I'm not specifically talking about how uh, energy guzzlers in data center could be, but then we'll talk about that in a little bit. <clears throat> Let's look at what's happening on the products design evolution. Now, in HVAC, uh, it has also been said that ever since uh, the inverter compressor was invented in 1981, and Toshiba was the brand which invented that in Japan, ever since then, there hasn't really been a huge path breaking work done in the residential space. Now, in the commercial space, of course, we have seen many other things play itself out. But what we are seeing will happen is uh, there is going to be a lot more focus on the overall way we design our systems from being just a mechanical device to how electronics are embedded and how we're going to have a lot more of internet of things getting embedded in the design from a life cycle cost bureau of energy efficiency for example also came out uh, on the residential acs as many of us might be able to relate with a setting of let's say a 24 degrees on the remote control and there are many more areas in which we as uh, manufacturers or policy uh, advocates would like to see that play itself out. And I'll maybe talk about that a little more as we progress into our discussion. Data analytics and IoT, I've just spoken about that. 
there is an altogether new dimension in indoor environment quality and uh, post covid the way we are seeing uh, covid itself as a trend which you will see on the left hand side below i think it is very much a trend it's very much an area which is going to impact the generation which is currently living through it and what is going to happen and how is that related to energy energy efficiency is also something that we're going to talk about Give me a moment. I think the slide stuck. Okay. So I did speak about this India Coding Action Plan, and I would encourage that since this is available in the public domain, uh, we have a diverse uh, audience today. Is what I'm told from uh, designers to architects to customers to professionals to students to homemakers, and I think it's applicable as a subject to each one. I would still recommend people interested in the subject must read. The India Cooling Action Plan, as it talks about two scenarios. One is the business as usual. So, if we let the business as usual be, it's really going to have a very adverse impact on the way the cooling demand will grow. It will grow at an aggregate, but it will also grow haphazard. And the impact of this can be cascading. Now, why am I saying that? Let me give you an example. In early July this year, there is a concept of peak demand that a lot of us probably will understand the peak load that we have on the grid. So we had a total peak load in India of about 200 gigawatts. Now, what we've done is uh, with the research partners with some of the other not for profit institutions, we've been able to ascertain that all the cooling appliances put together are possibly responsible for as much as about 25 to 30% of this cooling load. Of this uh, overall peak load. Now that is a staggering number of about 55 to 60 gigawatts. Now, if we continue to have unabated uh, built environment growth and we are not doing interventions, this can come back and be detrimental to the way our goals are. Which means that if you do specific interventions that have been outlined in the India Cooling Action Plan, it can have its impact on. Organizing responsibly. I think all of us also at carrier particularly, and I'm bringing in carrier because uh, since I've been noticing the change, the way that from innovation or invention to the overall taking responsibility and ownership. When we know that uh, there is an aspect, so let, let me try and share with you what sustainable development goals are which India is a signatory of. So India is also a signatory to, let's say, the 17 SDGs that we have at an India level. One of them relates with the health and well-being of the Indian citizens. Now, through research, it is definitely proven that for the health and well-being, it is important in hot, tropical, humid climate also to have conditioning. Now we can achieve this by both passive and active means. There is going to be a work that we responsibly undertake as an organization for both working with the designers on the passive design and also reducing the impact that it has from the cooling appliances or the technology that we come to the market with. We've gone ahead and signed up on what we call our ESG goals for this decade, the environment, social and governance. We've been known in the market for many years for governance and integrity with, with which carrier operates. On the environment side, we've actually taken this pledge that we're going to reduce our carbon footprint of our customers by as much as one gigaton in this decade. We are looking at investing more than $2 billion in doing this, but just for everybody's understanding, one gigaton is equivalent to the carbon emissions of an economy like Japan in a year. So, to put things in perspective. I'll focus, uh, like I said in the beginning, it's a broad topic. Let's see how we can relate this a little more to the built environment. This is something known that overall, the global energy usage, 40% of that roughly is by the buildings across the world. What is important to know is that 40% of that is by the HVAC systems and hence puts us in a very, very responsible position 
not just as an organization, but as consumers, listeners, decision makers, users of HVAC. Now, this translates to 16% of the global energy consumption, which is by HVAC. I mentioned at the beginning why I am a proponent of a green building overall is because I'm not saying that that's the be all and end all and we end by making a green building. So the first and the important aspect is to acknowledge that it gives me a framework. Framework to start structuring my thoughts, my actions, my interventions, and also takes it away that I don't have to just get certified and be there. So there is an active dialogue that we have, not just in IGBC, but across the globe now, and how do we have more sustenance of green building certifications? We are looking at operations. When I say sustenance, it is about operations and maintenance. There's a lot more technology that is going to play its role in minimizing the human error, making sure that we use the latest in machine learning, AI, controls, IoT, in doing that optimization, in operations and maintenance. And of course, it is not going to be only for the new build environment. We have a large stock of buildings that we've already created as India in the last about 40 years, ever since we started our reforms. And that building stock also needs to have an intervention if we have to look at energy efficiency holistically. So I'll give you an example as what we at Carrier did. We looked at a hotel which was built like 50 years ago. And this hotel is in Delhi. We didn't go in and say that you have an old chiller, so you change it. We just went in and made sure that through the use of IoT, electronics, controls, sensors, data analytics, we are able to bring the efficiency from a 1.1 kilowatt per ton to a 0.69 kilowatt per ton. This is in the public domain. This is awarded by the Bureau of Energy Efficiency as one of the best in class examples of why you don't need to necessarily spend a whole lot of money to get energy efficiency, whether it is for a new building or for an existing stock. Let's look at some trends on the HVAC side, since that's the industry that I belong to, so I'll definitely talk about that a little bit. So over a period of time, we are seeing that the conventional fixed speed uh, air conditioning systems are giving way to variable speed for obvious reasons. But one of them, which I think is important to have a dialogue, as I said, in a diverse audience that we have today, is because our loads are not constant, very simply speaking, throughout the day, whether it's a commercial building or a residential building, our loads are not constant. And if uh, that's not constant. How do we make sure that our systems are intelligent enough to adapt to the load and work through that? Now, this is happening across from residential to the, the light commercial to VRFs or to chillers. And the compression technology, frankly, has undergone a vast change. We can talk a lot more about that in some other uh, dialogue that we have or in question answer session, but I would like to just give you a high level picture first. Like I said, from one is to one or unitary products to moving to a central air conditioning. Now, obviously, this has a bearing on energy efficiency because we are looking at reducing, we're using diversity. So we've always used diversity, let's say, in the chill water systems. We're also starting to use a lot more diversity in the DX systems. What it also allows me is the ability to now look at uh, different indoor environment and utilize the new technology to reduce my energy footprint even further. It has created a challenge post COVID, but we'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. Um, I personally believe the point that you're reading next about low temperature setting to a comfort setting. My observation is that most air conditioning users, we have not done a good job in educating people on how to use air conditioning. A larger number of people believe that just by setting it at 18 degrees or 20 degrees, it's going to be cooling better. And that's the setting that we want to keep it at. I don't think that it works like that. And which is the way that we as a group 
or as uh, an institution, whether it's IGPC or carrier, are able to do this. Uh, I think it's not a, it's not an answer whether it can happen overnight, but this will take its own time. But we got to keep talking about this. In different climate zones, this will have obviously a different bearing, but it needs to have a separate discussion only because of the comfort settings and how energy efficiency can increase just by that. There is a large bearing on the refrigerant for sure. I some of you on the call uh, may have noticed how continents like Europe took lead in moving into the uh, zero ODP and low GWP much ahead of the others. Globally, multinational corporations have taken upon themselves now that in their industries, their plants, their offices, they are going to move towards a zero ODP or a low GWP refrigerant. It's important from a standpoint of uh, how much work we do on the field in install or in services and how much of that frankly gets uh, released in the atmosphere and what it actually goes and does. So it's not just about the energy that an aircon appliance uh, consume, but also what the refrigerant that it works on does to the environment. We've had in the HVAC industry, as I've seen in many years, a whole lot of focus in the past, and frankly, it remains to an extent even now, is product-based. And we have to start looking at this at a building level or a plant room level, or when we talk about a central air conditioning, how does the occupant behavior changes and how does it really, uh, how is it tied with the way our utilities work? And here, just to leave all of you with the thought that I have also observed is that as, a, as an economy, when we are maturing, we're giving a lot more focus today to knowledge than we have in the past. We've always bought products for what tangible products as products meant to us. But now we are starting to understand that there is a lot of science and knowledge behind not just the design install, but also servicing. And the more advanced we get, like I said, on controls IoT, the more we will start valuing this. Well, uh, the credit of this line actually goes back to the India Green Building Council. So there is a history in this that about uh, 20, 12 years, 13 years ago, it was the Green Building Center which had done its own study that in their own campus, the Green Building Center was able to observe that 89% of the cost was actually the running cost. And uh, only about 11% was the cost for purchase and maintenance put together. Maintenance was just a couple of percentage, but the, the initial cost was actually just about at best a 10% or a 8%. Now, if that be the case, what is it that we can do when we make a purchase decision or when we design or when we are involved in a process of buying something which is as much as HVAC. So in service side, we have seen a whole lot that when products go down, not only are they a headache on uh, the building occupants, it also post COVID has become more complex, but then can we look at from not just an energy point of view, but also a point of view of can we predict what will happen to our systems in time to come? And there can be more dialogue on this. This by itself is becoming a very large topic. We are at the center of doing a whole lot of things at Carrier on this and more on that later. Now, this is a topic that I have shared uh, in some settings in the past, but it's important that I talk about this and link it up to the energy efficiency. So in 2016, the first time uh, Carrier presented in the uh, Green Building Congress was the COG FX study. This is a study which is COG FX actually stands for cognitive function. And the study done uh, with the Harvard University. And this is available, frankly, to each one who's interested on uh, the Internet. All you have to do is just go and, and Google and search for it. What we were trying to study first started in the lab. We were trying to understand that what happens if we were to look at a green building, the functions of people who are living and working in a green building versus another high efficiency building. And how does it really impact? The experiment which involved 24 people in different environments gave us definitive answers on the sample size. 
and then we expanded this to multiple locations across the world to then confirm how it impacts the thinking, the cognitive function from a crisis response to a strategy and how it really helps in the sleep and the reduced health problems. Now, the last part of the sleep and the health problems, frankly, was a very good cue that our colleagues at Carrier US and Harvard got, which led us to do a two year study after that. I mean, frankly, this was a study which was going on the sample size. The sample was being collected, but what it did to us is it led us to start understanding what happens in a green building outside of the cognitive function that it impacts which is now called famously the health function study. These health benefits are co-benefits, but what came as a surprise to us when we are releasing, this is the second study that was released globally, and the third one is about to come, so watch out for this space. But in the second study, what we did, we studied multiple markets and countries across the world. I'm giving you an example of India here. So what you will see here, simple statistics, is at the country level, if we saved $1 on energy in India, shockingly, it translated into $12 plus saved on health and climate benefits. Now, Harvard has actually got a calculator which they have designed. You are welcome to go and study that on the, on the internet. This calculator is able to uh, throw out what is the combined benefit given the country's uh, health infrastructure, air pollution monitors, and, and there are multiple, there are complex ways in which the calculator calculates this. Now on the right hand side, we translated that of what happens in India. So in energy cost, let's say, with the green certified buildings that we studied from the year of 2000 to 2016, $72 million was saved in those green buildings on the energy costs but a staggering large number of close to $900 million was saved on the health and the climate benefits. 39 million of that being from the climate change and about 843 million coming on the health side. Now, when I'm saying the health side, it is clearly the cost that would have been incurred in less uh, deaths, the visits to the hospitals becoming less, the days that we lose out working or studying that becoming less. At a global level, just to share with all of you, what this showed us is in excess of $14 billion on health impact only through green buildings. Now, we're not saying that green buildings are only for energy efficiency. This is something that links up to energy, but imagine the energy impact of the collateral benefit that the energy efficiency has on the health. That, that is how powerful this is. Well, I did, Gary uh, did speak about this, that I've, I'm passionate about regulation. And uh, for any economy, in my opinion, to mature, we must have regulation. We must have level playing field. We must have uh, the way in which our consumers and customers can choose better. Now to choose better, it's important and I think a commendable work done by Bureau of Energy Efficiency in the last about 13, 14 years now. So what you're seeing on your uh, slide right now is RSE is the room AC, DFS is duct free split and uh, chillers BRF ducted and packaged. Now we are at a different stage uh, of each one of these in terms of the standards and labeling program. But what's important for us to understand is that we moved a long way when it comes to the first line, which is uh, the room air conditioners and the duct free splits. There is a lot more work to be done. The government is conscious of this. We are working very closely with the government and I'll give you a sense why. So if you look at what happened in, in India from 2009 to 2018 in terms of standards and labeling on the first row, which is the room air conditioners and duct free splits, we are looking at the ISEER stands for the seasonal energy efficiency ratio, the India uh, seasonal energy efficiency ratio. With the new table that we are about to get to on the room air conditioners, which impacts each one of us on the call, you and I, when we use a split AC or a window AC at home, that new table is going to put us with one of the best 
standards and labeling standards in the world. So let's say a 3.3 becomes the MAPS. MAPS is the minimum efficiency performance standard. Now, if 3.3 is the one of the best in the world, which is where Singapore government is, only with a size of 5 million, we are talking about uh, really pushing the way India is with uh, close to about so 50 lakh population in Singapore versus where we are at 130 crores plus. So you can imagine what an impact this is. So on one hand, we are conscious as a nation, as government says that the health and well-being of every Indian is important to us. We want to have good quality products for India through quality control order. At the same time, we are trying to say that whenever we urbanize, there is standards and labeling has a role to play in urbanizing responsibly. Yeah. But there are some more aspects of where we need to work. So giving an example, so let's say I bought an air conditioner in 2010 with whatever was a standard and labeling program that time. While the average life of the aircon in India is about seven years, let's say I replace that in 2021, but I sell off my old aircon. Now, like the government has worked on the scrappage policy, I think we as not just IGBC, but the institutions that we are, we got to come back together and see how do we have, let's say, a scrappage policy for old aircons as well. Now, if we choose not to have it, the old aircons can technically be in service for 15 years to 20 years. But what this will do is it will dent the efforts being made collectively by all of us in either reducing what I mentioned earlier on the peak load or the way that we are looking at reducing the energy cost of every appliance that gets used in any home in India. So another example of how we are looking at this. There is a dialogue that we are doing currently with the government on this. I'm sharing just an example, like I said, to provoke some thought. If you look at the India market on the left hand side, the first pie chart actually is about three star inverter being used. And I'm only talking about room air conditioners for a minute. That appeals, frankly, to a larger audience. I've taken room air conditioners as an, as an example. From a three star at 40%, five star only at 10%, and the conventional fixed speed at 50%. If, let's say, we were to change the mix and move to a five star of 30%, three star at 30%, only that much of change can result in a substantial benefit. How is that? So, the dialogue that we are having with the Bureau of Energy Efficiency is actually to do with the uh, reducing, let's say, the GST on the higher energy efficient appliances. If we do this, what will happen? The government's likely to lose revenue of up to about 250 crores, the finance ministry, right? What it will also do, the energy units that we consume, we're going to have a saving of as much as about 500 crores in a year, and we offset this. And there are multiple calculations, and we, we are having a dialogue right now with many authorities giving research data, and we are hopeful that at some point in time, we'll be able to impact because you know what it does? It actually looks at the supply side. So it looks at the entire peak load demand, the infrastructure that we need at the same time, the energy units that we can save. Now, what it really means for us is saving as much as one and a half million tons of carbon dioxide. And that's equal to more than three lakh cars being taken off the road. Now, that's the kind of impact that we can have only by moving how much the five star from a 10% to a 30% in the current labeling. Imagine if the five star were to move from a 30% to a 70% because all consumers, customers, each one of you on the call has chosen to be here today. You take away that when you make a decision, you make it for a life cycle of 10 years, but you choose the most energy efficient appliance, even if it costs a little extra right now. This is the last uh, before we get into a dialogue or some questions. Now, what's happening is that uh, we've seen from the independence time when we were, we actually had a surge in demand. We've been inadequate in many ways in our own energy generation. So we, as a country, have been working uh, diligently to become energy self-sufficient, energy security is critical to any nation. 
in many ways on the fossil fuels we are not there yet and which is another reason why there is so much of uh, reflection and dialogue we all must do on renewables at one point in time but what this tells us is that we've become energy adequate as a nation as we look at 75 years after our independence i'm not saying energy surplus we become energy adequate but what the covid has done for us is that now it's giving us a very difficult dilemma to work with in many segments of our economy as we come back as the economy comes back as the market comes back now how that is happening is that we've seen the impact that hvac has let's say on the buildings covid has uh, increased the need to have a better indoor air quality in the buildings which means the center for disease control the uh, nhs in uk and many other reputed organizations across the world have confirmed that if this virus spreads by air there have to be interventions in the building or the built environment which can either slow the spread or not have the spread it could mean we have more fresh air it could mean we have more air changes in a building it could mean we have advanced filtration it could mean we have more technologies like uvgi and so on and so forth so if i just pick up the need to have more air changes better ventilation or have more fresh air it's going to increase the overall tonnage required to cool the same built environment that we may not have had in the past now if that is happening this is definitely asking us to do something else so on climate change we obviously have been speaking for the last 20 minutes on uh, what we need to do on pushing more on technology so from suppliers manufacturers like us to uh, buyers and designers etc now we have to further improve the efficiency because what's going to happen is that if my overall tonnage in a building goes up my overall load in the building goes up of aircon if i have to consume the same energy my equipment and overall building efficiency has to go up yeah now both are actually at a conflict so economic recovery says that we need to have more investments there will be a lot more spent either on interiors fit outs new building etc customers are likely to look at buying utilities which are first cost cheaper to begin with which again is at a conflict with the entire dialogue of energy efficiency and manufacturers and government may want to relax some of the efficiency regulations because the industry is struggling so it's a combined and a complex problem from demand side where disposable income for people and businesses has gone down. Financially, there are most of the segments, frankly, are impacted adversely. The government wants to relax some of the standards. The buyers want to buy the first cost or the cheaper product, even if it means less energy efficient. COVID wants us to ventilate our built environment more. All of these three, as you can now put together, are a threat to energy efficiency as a dialogue. Now we need to have, there is no single silver bullet answer to that. We need to have a balanced approach. Now, when I say a balanced approach, we will need to keep evaluating how manufacturers or designers like us can continue to reduce our overall offerings and costs on the higher energy efficient appliances. The government at least keeps the regulation at a certain acceptable level, let's say where it is, which I showed to you. And the third, the businesses and the buyers don't cut corners only for a shorter term gain. If all of us are able to play our role, I think we can go past it. It will take us a year or two, but we will still be able to safeguard and not put millions of tons of air conditioning in the buildings that we are making now or retrofitting now, which will tomorrow then last for the next 10 years and make the entire uh, dialogue on energy efficiency more difficult for us. So with that, I'll take a pause and I'll hand it back over to Kiran and Giri. My uh, slides end with this and happy to take more questions if we have.